Good morning. The reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapters 1 and 2. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labour and they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labour in brick and mortar, with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labour, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stall, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had said to them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. As we begin this new series looking at the book of Exodus, uh, let's pray together and ask God for his help. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the book of Exodus and for all that it can teach us about who you are and what it means to be your people. Lord, as we come uh, before you this morning, we, we humbly ask that by your spirit you would teach us as we sit under your word. Guide us by your spirit, we pray. And we ask this in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. So as we begin the book of Exodus, this second book of the Bible this morning, we do so diving in, if you like, to part two of a really big story. You see, Exodus starts as the book of Genesis ends, picking up on and following on with the same story. So do have your Bibles open to Exodus chapter one and then later to chapter two, because in chapter one, verse five, we see that the number of God's people in, in Egypt numbered about 70 so it's quite a small beginning and as we heard from Ralph in the reading or if you know anything of the story you'll know God's people the Israelites did not stay small in Egypt more on that later but as we begin to look at this book I want to draw your attention to two big questions that we're going to come up uh, 
that we're going to kind of see all the way through the book of Exodus and they're really really helpful in in helping us to grasp what the book is all about okay the first question is this who is the Lord okay always have that in your mind as we're reading the book of Exodus who is the Lord how is he revealing himself in this book and the second is what does it mean to be the Lord's people okay now these are really important questions for us uh, in 2021 just as they were back 4,000 years ago. So today we've got the obvious challenges haven't we of living in the middle of a global pandemic with all of the staggering and frightening statistics that are flying around about infections and variants and deaths. Where is the Lord in all of this you might be thinking. But not just that amidst all this coronavirus stuff we need to remember that in the west the church is under increasing pressure. It's not just that Christian truth has moved from the mainstream to the margins on lots of issues. And, 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 what we, and, and often what we believe is now seen as offensive. But many, both inside and outside the church, wonder whether Christianity has any future. How can we live well and positively in the face of hostility? In other words, what does it mean to be God's people? A question faced? Uh, by those at the time of the exodus and by us today and um, one that we need to grapple with and a bit of a spoiler alert here okay we're going to see time and time again through the whole of this book of exodus that god is an expert in behind the scenes faithfulness okay he's an expert in behind the scenes faithfulness which is a massive encouragement to us today so if you're a christian this morning clinging on to your faith at the moment the book of exodus is for you if you're a christian on fire for the lord today the book of exodus is for you as you'll be built up by being reminded and challenged about who god is and what it looks like to be his people and if you're sitting watching today with all sorts of questions and feeling unsure thinking things like what is god doing at the moment why are things the way they are why doesn't god seem to answer my prayers then Exodus is the book for you too, as it deals with all of these important questions. Now a bit of background to the book of Exodus, which I think is going to be really helpful. Uh, Exodus chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 links back uh, to the story with which the book of Genesis ends. And some of the same words as you can see in Genesis chapter 46. Now from the book of Genesis we know that God's loving plan is to reverse the effect of our sinful rebellion of the fall which we see mapped out in the first 11 chapters of Genesis and then God reveals his loving plan by promising to a guy called Abram three amazing promises you can read about them in Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 to 3 God promises a land so the boundaries of which we're going to see um, uh, detailed in this book he promises Abram a land he promises him a people many descendants in other words so that they'll become a great nation and he promises him that it'll be a blessing so through him all nations and peoples of the world will be blessed people land and blessing okay those promises really set the context for this book of exodus and, and those promises in genesis 12 they're repeated in genesis 15 and 17 we're not meant to miss them and so through the rest of the bible we're looking out for how they're going to be fulfilled and these promises made, uh, or well, actually more accurately, they're covenants, okay? God makes covenants. And a covenant is a binding agreement between two parties. And we're going to see time and time again how God is a covenant-keeping God. We're going to see that in this first, chi uh, this first chapter as we focus on, uh, on one of those promises, particularly the promise about people. Okay, we're going to see how the, how the Israelites turn into a numerous people and how they're treated by the Egyptians. Firstly, we're going to look at this population growth. All right, now, we've already seen that Exodus starts as Genesis ends. We've seen that in these first six verses of chapter one. But what is helpful to know, right, is that there's around, what, between 350 and 400 years that pass between verse six and verse seven. Okay, there's a gap of about 350 to 400 years there. We know all about this from Exodus chapter 12, verse 40, but we'll come to that in a few uh, weeks' time. So, in that nearly 400 years, what do we see? 
verse 7, we see that the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Verse 12, we see the more they multiplied and spread. Verse 20, we see the people increased and became more numerous. We're not meant to miss this fact in chapter 1. We're meant to be looking back to the covenant made in Genesis and thinking, where is this people going to come from? And then, well, blimey, look, they're all here. Over many, many years, we see God's faithfulness to his covenant promises. He promised an elderly man, Abraham, who had a barren wife, Sarah, that he would be the father of a nation. And now look, after all these years, the Israelites are a numerous and populous people. As we think about the question, who is the Lord? We see that he is one who is faithful to his covenant promises. Remember, remember, remember that. God is faithful. But we also see, don't we, how the Israelites are treated by the Egyptians. Look at verse 8. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power. And then, you know what, as you read Exodus, you think, well, how can that be? How can they forget? But then, when you think, oh, it's about 400 years, then it becomes a bit more clear, doesn't it? Because I can be chatting to Ruth, and she can ask me to pick something up from the shops, and I can say, yes, of course. And then 20 minutes later, when I'm in the shops, forget the very thing I've been asked for. 400 years is a long time. Can you remember what one of the king's best advisers did in England uh, back in 1621? It was 400 years ago. We can't, can we? It's, it's just, it's, it's not a surprise when we, when we think like that. And then we see, because Joseph has been forgotten and all that he did for Egypt, how the Israelites are treated is, honestly, it's horrendous. In verse 10, we see how the new king wanted to deal shrewdly with the Israelites, yet the reality of how things pan out is much worse. In verse 13, we see that as the Egyptian fear grew of the numerous Israelites, they treated them ruthlessly. And that's also repeated in verse 14. And their work was harsh labour. We're told that twice in verse 14. Yet, this didn't seem to do the trick, did it? The Israelites continued to grow in number, such that the king ordered the Hebrew midwives to kill all the baby boys. An attempt to stop future population growth. They, of course, refused and the people became even more numerous and the midwives even had children of their own. And so, chapter one ends with the king bypassing the midwives and now dictating that all Hebrew boys that are born must be thrown into the River Nile. Whew. That is a horrendous situation, isn't it? A king is threatened and so commands the extermination of all the baby boys. Hmm remind you of anything we've just been thinking about the christmas story haven't we in recent weeks this is just what king herod ordered when the magi or, or, or ways ma wise men didn't return to him after visiting jesus herod was threatened by a new baby king and so he, ex he ordered the extermination of all the baby boys horrendous and incidentally where did mary joseph and jesus flee to escape herod's diktat Yep, they were refugees in, you guessed it, Egypt. This is just one of so many links in the New Testament uh, to the Exodus story. We're going to come across them again and again. And let me tell you, it is really beautiful. And it's one of the things that helps to convict me of the truth of the Christian faith, the way the whole Bible holds together. Now, let's just think about that second question. What does it mean to be the Lord's people? Well, Friends, it means hardship. God's people are always going to face the destructive threats of those who want nothing to do with the Lord. Again and again, throughout their history, the future of Israel would look fragile as successive foreign armies threatened to wipe them out. Throughout those times, God's people could return to this Exodus story and find hope and find confidence that, however bleak the setting, God would be at work to keep his promises and that matters because what is at stake each time is not just the future of the people but the future of God's promise of his covenant and therefore the future of our salvation as we've seen hundreds of years later 
King Herod ordered the slaughter of innocent children. This repeated threat to the people of God and therefore to the promise of God, his, his ability to keep his covenant, is part of Satan's ongoing rebellion against God. Satan is trying to destroy God's people in order that he might defeat God's promise. And the whole of the Old Testament is dominated by the promise of God that the one who will crush Satan will come from Abraham's family. Remember what I said, we're building on those kind of covenant promises in Genesis. So if Satan can destroy Abraham's family, then he can prevent the saviour being born and prevent his own defeat. Adapting Exodus chapter 1 verse 7, Christians have been fruitful and multiplied greatly and become exceedingly numerous so that the earth is filled with them. Praise God. Satan's plans now seem centred on trying to eradicate the church. But still there is growth. Just this week at our prayer meeting, we prayed for Christians in India, a country which is now number 10 on the Open Doors World Watch List for persecution. Where there is much persecution of Christians, yet the church continues to grow. God has purpose to keep his promises, and he will not allow anyone, not Pharaoh, not Satan, to thwart them. How can the church survive in the face of increasing hostility? How can you survive in your workplace or in your home, especially in your home at the moment? How can you be fruitful in the service of Christ when perhaps your friends and family despise your faith? How can you continue to follow God with all the questions that a pandemic brings? How can our church multiply in the face of kind of ridicule from our culture? It's because God has promised to fill the earth with the glory of Christ. Christ has promised to build his church. We read this in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18. God is still on the throne and he's the same as he was during the time of Exodus. He is the one we should fear, no one else. And that's just chapter one. So we're going to take a break for a moment. We're going to have a song, a song that reminds us of the beauty of God's word. And then we're going to hear from Ralph again uh, with our second reading from Exodus chapter 2. Your word is good, it's ever faithful, worth more than the heart's delight Your word gives life To all who hear and obey Your word endures forever Your word is true It never changes It formed the earth Sustains it still Your word defends Providing refuge and strength Your word endures forever Your word is a lamp unto my feet Your word is a light unto my path For your word is my hope It's my joy and my song Your word Forever. Your word transforms, it lifts the humble, rebukes the proud, protects the poor. Your word discerns. 
chapter 2. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it, put it amongst the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket amongst the reeds, and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labour. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs with water to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Ruel asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave, gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. This is the word of the Lord. So thank you, Ralph, for reading Exodus chapter 2 for us. In chapter 1, we saw the beginning of God's fulfilment of promises to Abraham regarding people, didn't we? The people became very numerous, but we haven't seen much yet about the promise of land, have we? So let's see what chapter two has to tell us. In chapter two, we are introduced to a very special baby. Now we don't learn his name immediately, do we? In verses one to four, we see how the baby is born. Under the cruel law of the king of Egypt, the baby is hidden for three months. 
I mean, if you just try and uh, put yourself in the shoes of that family, it's truly horrendous. Hiding your baby with all the challenges, both emotionally and practically, that that would bring is so difficult. And then in verse 3, we see how things eventually became impossible. The baby couldn't remain hidden any longer. And so the family make the impossible choice that they have to follow the command. But they do so cleverly. The baby is laid, in verse 3, in a papyrus basket and placed in the river Nile. Now, in another amazing piece of detail, the word for basket in Hebrew is the same as that for ark. Hmm. Just as Noah and his family were saved from judgment in the ark, look at what is going to happen to this baby. I love these details in the book of Exodus. They're brilliant. What happens next is another clear example of God's behind the scenes faithfulness. Do you remember I mentioned that in regards to chapter one? You see, God's name is not even mentioned until verse 23 of this chapter, but you can see his hands all over what is happening. Pharaoh's daughter, of all people, goes to the river, finds the baby, feels sorry for him, takes him in as her own, and then gets the baby's mother to come and care for him on the suggestion of the baby's sister and even pays the mother for doing this. You couldn't write it. It's incredible. Then she gives the baby the name Moses because he is drawn out of the water. Moses is rescued by being drawn out of the water. Spoiler alert again. How are God's people rescued from slavery? Yes, by being drawn out of the water. They cross in the dry through the Red Sea. It's another incredible parallel. You'll have to forgive me because I'm going to get excited as we go through this. Now, as with all these things, there's so much that could be said. Okay, There's so much that we could uh, say about chapter 1 and chapter 2, and we're just not going to be able to cover it all. But uh, there are some useful resources that I will keep pointing us to over the coming weeks. Okay, So look out for them. Now, uh, we hear about uh, Moses kind of as a baby, and then next we kind of hear of him, he's a man. He's a Hebrew being brought up as an Egyptian in the royal court. And in verses 11 to 14 of chapter 2, we see what happens when Moses saw how his own people were being oppressed. With that harsh labour and ruthless treatment that we learnt of in chapter 1, verse 14. Moses takes revenge by killing an Egyptian whilst he was mistreating a Hebrew, kind of thinking that nobody was watching. Here, in a way, we see Moses behaving like an Egyptian. We see in some ways he sees his part uh, to play in, in delivering his people, but at this point, he doesn't know how to do it in the right way. Moses responds to the unjust aggression of Egypt with unjust aggression of his own, and so he becomes a murderer and he has to flee to Midian in verse 15. Not only is Moses threatened by Pharaoh, but he's lost the respect of his own people. What's going to happen now to God's promises? We know that Moses will liberate God's people from Egyptian slavery, but here he behaves like an Egyptian slave master. He needs to unlearn the ways of the Egyptian court. And it's a reminder that we can't do God's work in a worldly way. Now, in this next section of chapter 2, we see Moses going home. Hmm, Moses going home. Moses is going to Midian. And it's not actually that he's had to flee his home, it's actually that he's gone home. Let me explain. Okay, do you remember that promise of land is made to Abram in Genesis? Well, Amazingly, Midian is part of the promised land. This is where Moses flees to, and in many ways it's here that he goes home. From the details of chapter 2, which, which we haven't got time to go into, he finds a new family, he marries, and he has a child. Look at verse 22. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Now what does that foreigner bit mean? I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. It's Moses acknowledging that now he is classed as a foreigner in Egypt, where once he was at home and part of the royal household. He's now classed as a foreigner. Egypt is a foreign land. It's not his home any longer. This is a glimpse into the future of God's 
future, uh, God, God's people's future home in the promised land. And then we get this interesting bit where we read about God remembering. Hmm. Have a look at verse 23 to 25. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. The Israelites say continued to be mistreated even after the king of Egypt dies and they call out to God for rescue. In verse 24 we see that God heard their groaning and remembered their covenant. Now at first glance when you hear that you could think had God forgotten? Surely that wouldn't make sense would it because we've already seen really clearly his, his kind of behind the scenes faithfulness with lots of things in chapters 1 and 2. So it can't be that God had forgotten like I would forget what's on the shopping list. So what does it mean? Well remembering is a covenantal term. It means deciding to act in order to fulfill the covenant. A covenant, remember, it's that binding agreement between two parties. It's not that the promise to Abraham had somehow slipped God's mind. It's not that he got distracted by other things. No. Remembering means God is about to take the next step in the fulfillment of his promises. Verse 25 is literally, God saw the people of Israel and he knew. He knew their suffering and he knew his promises. And we've got to remember, this story is not just a story of how God liberates, uh, liberates one particular oppressed people. It's a story of how God fulfills his promise to bring salvation to all people. What's at stake is not just the liberation of one nation. This story will set the pattern for the liberation of all nations from bondage to Satan and sin. The Bible is a story of God leading us back home. This is why this is our story too. And the fact that God remembers, or in other words, the fact that God acts on his covenants is a huge encouragement and reassurance to us. It shows us that the end of chapter 2 is not the end of the story. Because at the end of chapter 2, if you think about it, we have a people without a land and we have Moses in the land without a people. There's so much in this, isn't there? Let's just draw our time together in these two chapters with one final thought. In some ways, we face the same choices Moses uh, faced. Every Christian is in the same situation. After our conversion, the land of our birth and our upbringing becomes, in a way, a foreign land to us. Now we are pilgrims heading for the promised land, the home that is kept in heaven. So we have to choose which home will set our priorities, which home will shape our behaviour, which home will define our standard of living. Will we choose the pleasures of sin and the treasures of Egypt or will we choose to be ill-treated along with the people of God? Will we choose disgrace for the sake of Christ? That's the stark choice. Will you live for pleasure and treasure? Or will you live in disgrace? Moses chose the disgrace. Why? Because he was looking forward to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. Notice again how his faith meant he did not fear the king, just like the Hebrew midwives didn't in chapter one. How do we live in the face of hostility? It's by looking to the home that God has promised. And by fearing God rather than men. The story of Exodus is part of the bigger story of God's promise to Abraham, a story of which we are a part. There is so much more to come. Can I encourage you uh, to have a read of Exodus chapter 3 and 4 before we meet together again next week? Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this book of Exodus. Thank you that it is so rich in mapping out that pattern of how you bring salvation to your people. Keep us mindful of these things, Lord, and, and help us, Lord, to count the cost and be willing to follow you, even when it feels like we are foreigners in a foreign land. Thank you for the great reward 
and that you promise to bring all of your people home. Keep us mindful of those things as we live through many trials and struggles at this time. And we say this prayer in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, again and again, there's this repeated theme of God's faithfulness through the book of Exodus. So uh, we're going to sing now, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Sun, moon, and stars in their. 